Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. On the 7th of January 2015, Charlie Hebdo came under a brutal attack. The Kouachi brothers burst into the office of the newspaper and opened fire killing 12. Of the dead on that day, George Volinsky, cartoonist and founder of the newspaper. Today, Marise Volinsky has published her own book, Au Risque de la Vie, Putting Life on the Line. Hello and welcome. Hello. A first question, why did you choose that title? Well, I was inspired by Simone Weil's sentence, where she talked about putting one's life on the line for the truth. And it corresponds to the way I feel as well. It's true that I'm looking for truth about this particular assault and at the risk of my life. You've read the book, so you know that I am actually ill. And we will talk about that. But before we move on to that, uh, something struck me in your book, how Chef Kawashi is omnipresent throughout the book. He is almost like a shadow that is always there, something that just won't disappear. Even in writing about him, do you feel that you have been able to move on and get rid of that shadow? You even said that the terrorist is part and parcel of you. Yes, well, when I started working on the investigation that I carried out in my first article, which was called Darling, I'm off to Charlie, that was a year after the assault, I worked on images, photos of Sherif and his brother. In fact, I chose uh, Sherif because Saeed himself was in poor health. He had issues breathing, he had to be on his Ventolin, her spray and he couldn't actually shoot straight. So the real killer was his brother. And he was the one, Sherif, that I was absolutely obsessed by. I looked at all these photographs and these images of him to such an extent that he became part of me. He was in me. He, I was stifling. And through writing about him, have you been able to get rid of him? So how to get how do I get rid of that? How do I get over it? And I said the only way perhaps would be by writing. Anyway, that's what I do, that's my job, and it's probably one way in which I could get him out of me. He was actually preventing me from leaving with his Kalashnikov. Actually, you speak about that. Uh, you speak of how when you dream you can hear the gunfire. But also in the book we read how the darkness is still something quite frightening for you. Nighttime is frightening for you. But when reading the book, we also feel that there's a sense of resilience. No. No, I don't actually believe in resilience. At least given the fact that it was so violent and all the violence that followed afterwards, I don't think it's possible to be resilient. What does that mean after all? It's rebuilding something or the other afterwards. And I don't think that's possible. In fact, we've got to start from scratch. I always say that a couple is like a cathedral. You've got to build it stone by stone. And here, everything has collapsed. So we've really got to start from scratch. And I feel, and I'm not the only one, the other spouses and others say that you can't actually talk about a form of resilience when you're talking about Charlie Hebdo. So the cathedral has come tumbling down, but we can see that you are still here. And in fact, uh, throughout the book, you speak of your husband and you speak, you never actually mention his first name, you speak of your lover. Does that help? Well, death is... I've got it in me. I'm carrying it with me. I don't really like the word husband. I, I like the word lover. In the interviews, I find it really difficult to talk about uh, lover, despite all of that, and I prefer speaking about a husband. But he is my lover, and this allows me uh, to survive, but I hope soon I'll be able to live. 2020 is quite an interesting year, primarily because the trials are going to start for the terrorists, as well as the two brothers, Amdi Koulibaly, who killed the police officers down in Montrouge, and also a number of people at the kosher supermarket in the east of Paris. 
You feared this time because it felt like you were going to be taken back into it. Oh, yes, of course. Obviously, we're going to be up to our necks in it again. We're going to hear all about it, about the attack, the assaults. We're going to hear from these accomplices who are going to be in the box and being accused. Twelve, of, There are 14 of them. Two of them are still on the run. So, yes, I am very afraid about the trial. The trial is going to be a personal trial as well for me. But what do I expect from it? I'm not expecting too much because it's a trial of the accomplices, the intermediaries of uh, Sheriff and Koulibaly. It's their trial. We're going to be hearing about them, what got them to do what they did. But it's not a trial of the attack. We're not going to really understand why the attack took place. And what I'm interested in is shedding light on why it took place. Why were there so many things that didn't actually work uh, properly? You can look at them in her order. There were so many strange facts. Uh, for example, her sheriff. Uh, went to Yemen. For a long time, people thought it was Said who'd gone to Yemen because Sheriff went with his brother's ID papers. When he got back from Yemen, the intelligence services know that you don't just come back from Yemen just like that. You normally come back with the goal, with the mission. And then he was left to roam free. And you wonder why that was possible, why the intelligence services didn't do anything about that. And then after that, uh, the uh, police uh, surveillance uh, on the Charlie Hebdo offices was removed. One month uh, before the attacks, uh, the police uh, guards around the Charlie Hebdo offices were removed. Now, why was that the case? One of the policemen talked to me and said that many of the policemen who were on duty outside the Charlie Hebdo offices were regularly threatened. So. What does that mean? Was the choice uh, saving uh, the uh, policemen who were on duty and keeping them safe? Uh, and this was detrimental to the artists. Uh, yes, I mentioned this in my book. You actually speak about that in your book. And you also speak about uh, the fact that you are a plaintiff in the case, but you're not actually seeking damages as a victim. Why is that? No, I mean, there's only one victim, and that's my husband, George Volansky. I well, for most people, I'm a victim who suffered collateral damage. But I don't like this term and being a victim, because when you become a victim, well, not the main victim, but you're no longer fighting. And I want to continue fighting for the truth. The other fight that you mention is you fighting the illness directly after the attacks few months later. In fact, you actually give the impression in your book that the illness came about directly due to the terror attacks and the violence of those attacks. Yes. Uh, I really say that my body was attacked as well. When you have that form of violence, your entire immune system is completely shattered. And there's a lack of harmony between your mind and your body. And that's where illness uh, can come in. There's chaos in your body, and this leaves the door open to illness because your immune system is no longer working properly. I've read a lot about this. Uh, for example, her Professor Kayat explains this very well. And this is after studying many patients and many cases uh, over many years uh, for other people who suffer from lung cancer. And he realized that, that the trigger was always some sort of uh, sharp emotion. And in my case, it was particularly violent because on the 7th of January, the day of the attack, I remember when I was told about uh, my husband's death, it was as if I was struck by lightning. So for me, illness, 
showed up six or seven months uh, later, but I think it was already there in my body when the attack took place. You also briefly mention in your book uh, the issues around money and Charlie Hebdo, but you ultimately say that it's not that important because Charlie Hebdo is so much more than that. Yes, of course. Yes. Some people uh, want to take action against Charlie Hebdo again uh, because of all these old uh, financial questions. There were donations that poured in. The donations were then uh, distributed to some of the families or not. As far as I'm concerned, I don't really care. What I want is that this magazine, uh, for which my husband was one of the founding members, continues to survive. It's a satirical, provocative magazine, and we need that in a democracy. And also, it is a magazine where uh, the freedom of expression is uh, preserved and the freedom to blaspheme. There was something I wanted to touch on with you. Francois Hollande was the president back at the time of the attacks, and he recently spoke out saying that he is fearful that the country is going to fall apart and said that, well, back in the day, the terrorists actually didn't succeed. But what is your view on contemporary France? Do you think the terrorists failed? Is the country still holding together? Well, I think our country is fractured. You've had the yellow vests, uh, you've had a lot of communitarism. You can't say that everybody is united, but there was a sense of solidarity after the attack. You remember the major demonstration that took place. Today, I don't think it's really united. Thank you. Marie Zvolansky, thank you very much for your time. Your book, once again, Au Risque de la Vie, Putting Life on the Line. Stay tuned for further shows on France 24. This interview will be available on replay on france24.com. Thank you very much.